Shalom Chavarim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. The message that I did the other day, the Vatican is hiding the truth, is a message that has blessed many people. It's been watched over 7,000 times. And out of the people that have watched it, we have 13 dislikes, about 349 likes. But I felt like it was necessary to do a follow-up message on this. And the reason being is because there were a few people that have misunderstood exactly what I'm saying. And it seems to me, the ones that have done this, now not all of them, but some of the ones that have done it, it's, it's done, I think, misunderstanding what I'm trying to say, or possibly because there are, there are some that really believe in their hearts that the King James Version of the Bible is without errors. Uh, and I know that that may, uh, how, how would I say this? Uh, well, let me just say like this here. For example, since I was a young man, I have used a King James Version Bible for most of my life. As you can see, all the little markers and stuff, I'm always studying the Word of God. But I also can read from the original language as well. And so I have Hebrew Bibles, I have uh, interlinear Bibles, I, I study the words themselves, I, I study the languages, and even with the Greek language, that more of an amateur side for me there, but still studying and doing research. That's why we're called the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And the purpose is, is to dig out, to find out what is God really saying? And why do we do this? It's because the Bible has been translated from its original inspired languages to other languages. And then as we begin to see things, we realize that there's been an agenda going on in the background. Like, for example, many of the sisters even have been blessed to find out that God never instituted women into slavery, so to speak, that they should be slaves to men. We find out that in the, in the Hebrew text that when God says to, to Eve that your husband shall rule over you, it was not a divine decree that he was some great, wonderful guy that did nothing wrong and his wife was all to blame and now God is going to make her him, uh, excuse me, him your boss. It was to the contrary. We find out that the words of Paul, the way they were translated, when he says, like, for example, uh, you shall be as they translated in King James, you shall be saved in childbearing. Well, you know, that should wake up the King James people to begin with because most people that, that, that know the, the fundamentals of the gospel know that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Him alone, not through having babies. So then when we find out, we look at the Koine Greek and the actual words that are said there, what is Paul dealing with? He's dealing with a doctrine of Diana or Artemis that is a worship of, of a female goddess that, that believed that in order for you to have your children without having complications, that you had to go to the goddess of Diana and worship her in these strange sex orgies in order to be sure that your wife will not have problems. So Paul is dealing with this situation, and then he concludes and says, you shall be safe in childbearing. Not saved, but safe but they mistranslate these words and many other words that Paul used that are used against women. Like, for example, that, you know, that, uh, that she is to remain silent as also saith the law. Now, it's just paraphrasing, of course. Uh, but the thing is, is there is no law in all the Torah where it says that the women are to remain silent and their voice is not to be heard. We don't find that in the Torah, but we do find it in the Talmud. But... Many women were blessed to hear these things, to find out that there were mistakes. But then even there are some women, and men as well, that are so determined to believe that the King James Version has been so inspired of God that there's not one single word wrong in there. Okay, so let's take that argument and let's examine it, examine this by the Word of God then. I want you to take with me and go to Matthew chapter 17 in your King James Bible. And let's read this together. Let's start with verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now this is where Jesus, with his apostles there, he meets Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. They appear before him. 
And just like we find in the, in the, in the uh, book of Zechariah, the two olive branches that stand on either side of the golden lampstand. Yeshua is that golden lampstand. And Moses and Elijah, a type of the two witnesses, or a type of the spirit of Moses and Elijah that will be anointed on the two witnesses, is standing there on either side of him, bearing witness that they are the two olive branches, or the two anointed ones. And they're standing there with him on either side. And so uh, they, they see this vision here. Uh, and the Bible says in verse 6, And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Now watch what he says here. Or the question is asked. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Okay? Verse 11. And Jesus answered and said to them, Elias, or Elijah, that's the Greek word for Elijah, truly shall first come and restore all things. Now, I've read this in the Greek, and it is a future tense, and it is, it's an event that will happen in the future. Now, when he says this, you have to keep in mind, John is already dead. John had came, he ran his course, Now he goes on to say, but I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. That's in the past. But in the first part here, he says, Elijah truly shall first come, and what? And restore all things. Now, I have to ask this question. The King James people, and like I say, I say this with, with, with great reverence, with, with godly love, brothers and sisters. But if, if you really believe that the King James Version is so perfectly done without any errors or mistakes, then you are saying that it is the restoration of the Word of God. Then why then in the King James Version Bible does it say that Jesus said that truly Elijah shall first come and restore all things? Think about that. If King James is perfect, there needs, no, needs not to be a restoration. But something is wrong in order for Jesus to have to come and restore all things. You remember the other day when I read to you from uh, the, the version of Matthew 24 from the way it was written in the, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, which was the Essene community in Jesus' time? And he even says in there, speaking of the exact same thing, he says he'll send his messengers, which are the two witnesses, and they will restore the holy law. So, and everywhere, and even this very words here is also written in that particular document as well. It's right in there, and it says in there the same thing. Just like he says here in Matthew 17, says it the same way there as well, that Elijah would first come and restore all things. So if Elijah is going to come to restore all things, then clearly something is not restored. Something is not right. And then you have to ask yourself the other question. For example, in, 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 in different doctrines I mean, in the church and stuff, there's all kinds of doctrines. How is there going to be, if you look at a rapture, most people believe in a rapture. Some differ on the, on the timing, but most people believe in a rapture. Some believe that there's not one at all. But let me challenge you on this then. If God is going to take and call a bride in a resurrection, a rapture, by what authority can he call it without a restoration? Who's got it right? 
Now, I know that there are those that believe and teach that Elijah has already come and he's restored the word, and that there's people that believe that he's come in this day and age that we're living in now. There's been several that have believed that. But the question is, is or, or not so much a question, but clearly nowhere did anybody that is claiming to have been the Elijah of what Jesus says here in Matthew 17, or for that matter, of Malachi chapter 4, because notice Yeshua only applies half of the verse of Malachi 4 to John. And that was the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children, which was the Messiah. Their heart's desire was to see the Messiah. Look at Job. I know my Redeemer liveth, and in the last days... I shall see him. My eyes shall behold him for myself and not another. Not another set of eyes, in other words. They all looked for the coming. Jacob wrestled with him, the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. So Elijah, which was John in this case, was turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. Their heart's desire was to see the coming of the Messiah. But the children of Israel did not receive him. The Pharisees did not. Now, there were many that did believe him and were glad when he came. But the second part, the turning of the heart of the children to the fathers, he never applied that to John. That's to get, that's to get the children of Israel to recognize that they missed the Messiah. But as I begin to see that Yeshua says that Elias must first come and restore all things, it's beginning to make me wonder, are the two witnesses only for Israel? Or could it be that they're to open the eyes of the blind of Israel and at the same time put that bride into that proper, the proper place that she should be? You have to remember, as a bride of Christ, even though you're a Gentile, you are truly a Jew in that respect. You're grafted in. Because if you're going to be, if it's going to be a bride without spot or wrinkle, and yet Yeshua himself says, Elias must first come and restore all things, how in the world can you be without spot or wrinkle? Do you go in because the Baptists say it this way? Or do you go in because the Pentecostals say it's this way? Or do you go in because the Methodists say it's this way? Or, 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 or what other non-denominational belief that's out there that says it's this way? Let me tell you something. When Elijah comes to restore with Moses the word of God, women are going to be liberated. The things that have been scrupled up in these translations and stuff is going to be corrected. And so the other day when I shared with you from the book of Jeremiah, and I'll go back to it because remember, in King James, Jeremiah chapter 8, King James words it as, the, the, the pen of the scribe is in vain. You know, and, and, and this is what really got the people riled up that are so dedicated to the, to the King James Version. Listen, all of these different translations, some are better than others, maybe so. And, and I know that King James in many places, he's got, they did some really outstanding work on translation and, and, and where in other places they did not do so well. But you know, but you've got to face the facts of what the Word of God says. They put in here in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, How do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribe is in vain. See, when you read it from what King James translates this as, it's like God is saying, you claim the Word of the Lord is with you, but... It's like the, the, what the scribe's work was in vain because you don't believe it. That's what it makes it sound like. That's not what Jeremiah said in the Hebrew language, though. Shin kokresh, shakar. What does shakar mean? It means a lie. And so when we actually read it from the Hebrew, Hebraic side of it, they got the first part right. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it a lie. 
That's what he said. You see, Jeremiah didn't play church. And you cannot get stuck on a translation. I mean, you, 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 it's like taking the translators and making them as if they're God. When in your own Bible, Jesus clearly said, and I can see that this is right because I've looked at it in Greek, I've looked at it in multiple different translations, I've looked at it even in the, the different ones, that I've looked at it from the Hebrew Matthew that was, that was preserved by the Jews, of where they say that Matthew wrote this, and in every single one of them, even in the Dead Sea Scroll writings, that particular part of Matthew 17 clearly says that Elias must first come, Elijah that is, because Matthew writes it as Elijah, that it must first come and he will restore all things. And Jesus said it must happen. So therefore, something is wrong, not just, and this is not to pick on King James. The NIV's got it problems. The King James has got problems. The New World versions have got, every translation out there has got problems. You know, my brother, sister, let me tell you, this is, this is serious what we're getting into. Do you realize that God is about to send the two witnesses on the scene to do what? To straighten out these messes. I wonder if the people will believe them when they come. It's not going to be many. Do you not realize when we read in the book of Revelation, what does it say there? That, 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 that uh, the whole world hears their ministry. The world rejoices at their death, too. This is why I, I'm beginning to be more persuaded. I mean, we, we've uh, often we just look at this as thinking, well, they're only to the Jews. Well, if they're only to the Jews, then why does, why does it say that the whole world, God sends them, and according to the, to the, to the, to the writings that, that they wrote uh, back with the, the scenes that they cataloged of Jesus, Jesus says that they will come to restore the law. You know, that's why I say the Bible that we have, well, I don't care if it's King James or whatever, yeah, they got things scrupled up about women. They got things scrupled up about the law. They got, they got a lot of scruples in there because they've misinterpreted or mistranslated things. But it doesn't mean that the salvation plan is not there. It's in every single one of them. But for some reason, Jesus seen that he's got to send Moses and Elijah to straighten us all out. This is what he did with Israel. Do you not realize this is what he did with Israel? The Jewish people had Moses' writings, and yet there still was always a problem. He had to send Isaiah. He had to send Hezekiah. He had to send Ezekiel. He had to send Jeremiah. He had to send uh, Micah. He had to send Nahum. He had to send Jonah. Constantly sending prophets to do what? To get them straightened out because they kept doing things wrong. So what I'm saying to you, I'm not saying these to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get you to wake up because God is not here to play church. We have to face the facts. In 325, Constantine, with the help of what is called some of the early church fathers, and also we know for a fact from historical documentation, Mithras priest, decided to canonize what they would make the Bible. Now, it's not to say that they weren't using real documents, but the thing is they also chose to leave out some things too. Why? It didn't go along with their ideology. And they decided to, to translate things a certain way. Why? Because you have to understand, Constantine in Rome, they believed in a patriarchal system, a hierarchy. They certainly couldn't have Paul be teaching these words that women were liberated. They couldn't have it like that, so they had to do some changes there. That's what restoration will do. I can only imagine what type of ministry they'll have. Anyway, I don't want to hold you any longer on this. We're going to be going into news here very shortly, but I just wanted to share this with you. To, to seriously think about what God is saying. We're living in a very late hour. We don't have time to play church. I 
trust this message is a blessing for you. God bless you.